We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Trash back in studio, back on two for one drafts. I will say this when you replaced Mike Brennan when he had COVID 19, there were a number of people, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people wanting Anthony Trash back on the podcast. Now, your time to shine again. Renner prioritizing Christmas, prioritizing New Year's with his new girlfriend. You step back in the studio with AG. How are you feeling? No, I'm feeling pretty good, and I'm here to fill in for Mike Renner, but I'm also here to refute an absurd take <laughs> you made last week. It might be the worst Uh-oh. take I've ever heard on the two for one drafts pod. You know which one I'm talking about? I do. I think you do. I, Anthony Trash, am not the biggest lightweight in the company. Come on. That's that was fair. a that was a That's straight up lie. I think Neil has a son that might be a bigger lightweight. Ethan Hornsby is like 18, 17 years old. My bigger lightweight. Who knows? But uh how was your Christmas, man? It was pretty good. Um yeah. H- hung out with the fam. What'd you do? Yeah, hung out with the fam, drank a lot, a little too much, ate a lot. That's what holidays are for. Exactly. Once you get to this age, that's all that matters. Drinking too much and eating too much is what the holidays are for. Producer Mike Quinn, I haven't asked you, how was your holidays, man? It was good, man. I uh, also ate too much and drank too much. And I'm glad, Trash, I'm glad that you are um, sticking up for yourself because you've kind of been called out a lot on this pod. Austin and Mike kind of call you out. Dude, something you were called out for was Clemson not going to cover the number against Notre Dame, and Mike Renner wanted to bet the beers. And then here we are. We, <laughs> Renner's in a pit of misery in that game. Ends up leaving blacked out in like the third quarter. They cover that number, no problem. So earning I, that I, back. I still might pay sure. up for the first bet just because I felt bad. You know, sure. I, in the middle of the game, I was like, I know he's probably you know stressed and depressed, needs to take some time off. Renner and I had a side bet in that one, by the way. Mike Renner, I bet Mike Renner that if Notre Dame wins, I'll buy him any jersey he wants, any Notre Dame jersey he wants. And if, if Clemson wins, because they're favored by 10, he splits a jersey with me. Guess what I'm getting? Retro, Marshall Falk, San Diego State jersey. It's going to be sick. I can't wait. I'm going to rock it on the pod maybe every single podcast episode in a row. All right, let's jump into the storylines here. I want to start the podcast with this. It's easy to look at top-performing rookies like we do every Monday, and we have a top-10 mock draft coming down later in the show. But there are some interesting quarterback situations panning out in the NFL right now. And I want to start first and foremost with the Sam Darnold-led New York Jets, who are coming off what? Back-to-back wins? They beat the Cleveland Browns this past week and the Rams previously. And now people are starting to get on board, despite them being locked into the number two overall pick, with building around Sam Darnold. I saw someone tweet out they should draft Panay Sewell and have the best tackle tandem in the NFL for 10 years. Hang a banner for that as Sam Darnold leads you to 7-9. and nine. That, I, I can't get on board with this take. Sam Darnold's best with a good supporting cast next year, new coaching staff, whatever you want. Give New York Jets an ideal situation this offseason. Improve across the board. Add Lincoln Riley. Add a bunch of coaches. Best, best improvement is taking this team from a two-win team to a 7-9, 8-8 team, purgatory, the last place you want to be in the NFL. I do not see him making that leap that Josh Allen has made. I do not see him making that leap that other quarterbacks have made in the past. We've seen enough on Sam Darnold to feel confident in trying to make an upgrade at the position. One, because he hasn't played well. Two, because the next time he's playing, you're going to have to sign him to a longer extension, and now he's no longer on that rookie contract, which helps you benefit the roster. Do you have a different opinion? Am I crazy to think it's obvious they should take a quarterback at two? No, I think you're completely sane. I think the whoever said that they should keep Sam Darnold and draft Penny Sewell is the crazy one. I mean, you got to dump the man. At, at this point in his career, we've seen enough on him. And, yes. you know, Josh Allen, he, he has had one of those anomaly type of breakouts in that third year. You know, Sam Darnold, it's come and gone. He has not had it. I don't care what the Jets have done these last two games. You know, the decision making when he was coming out of USC, that was our big concern. And that's proven to be, you know, a rightful concern because it's not been good. Same with the accuracy. Mm-hmm. They, they just got to cut ties. 
start from scratch. They have a incredible, incredible quarterback prospect, two of them right there, at the second overall pick. That's pretty rare. That Those kind of guys, I think, would go number one overall. Yes. And so I, I think they're sitting pretty right now. You got to dump Sam Darnold and take one of the you know next guys after Trevor Lawrence, whether it be Zach Wilson or Justin Fields. And, and Mike Renner has said this too. In a different draft class where Trevor Lawrence isn't in or doesn't exist, Zach Wilson and Justin Fields – Probably go number one overall. So that's what you have there. Two, you don't have to dump Sam Darnold. You can keep him and play him as the backup if you still think he has some juice and you still think he has some value. Three, and I've brought this up multiple times, if your starting quarterback, Sam Darnold, would not get a second rounder on the open market, he's probably not your guy. He's probably not your guy. I don't think a team trades a second rounder for Sam Darnold, and you'd be lucky to get a third rounder for Sam Darnold based on what you've seen. And four, I'll bring up a fourth point on this one, and I'll, I'll close the books. Everyone wants to bring up the situation. Worst coaching staff in the NFL. Who's he throwing to? Brashad Perriman, Denzel Mims, Christian Herndon. There's not enough there. The offensive line, terrible. The defense, can't do it. There are worse situations in the NFL, or at least close to it, where other young quarterbacks have shown flashes of success sustained across multiple weeks. Sam Darnold has flashes of throws, not games, throws where he's had success with this bad situation. While Joe Burrow isn't in an ideal situation and has played well as a rookie before he got hurt. Justin Herbert, I wouldn't even say is in an ideal situation. That's one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL. And that defense has underperformed this year with Derwin James Hurt. They're like, again, Tua Tungvaluwa, who hasn't played all that well, but has arguably played better than Sam Darnold this year has been in a bad situation with a banged-up offensive line, barely any running backs left on that roster, and a defense that, yes, is overperforming, but still, it's not been an ideal situation. You're never going to find an ideal situation. Again, I don't think the Jets would be smart to pass on one of these quarterbacks and take a different different player at two. If they are deciding that, I will say you can trade down. It's not what you should do. But the, here's the last thing you should do at number two overall. Now that they're locked in, the last thing you should do is take a non-quarterback at two. That's the last thing. The second to last thing is trading out of that pick because you think your roster is only a few pieces away with Sam Darnold on it. That's the second to last thing. The obvious answer, again, taking Fields or Wilson at number two overall, whichever one you like best. Moving on to this next quarterback situation. Dwayne Haskins and the Washington football team. I had to tweet out this timeline because I was reading it out loud in my head, and it's absolutely absurd. Dwayne Haskins, they pass on quarterback at two. They pass on Tua Tungavailoa and Justin Herbert to take Chase Young, who has been the defensive rookie of the year, has had the third highest single season grade by a rookie edge defender we've ever seen in the PFF era, has been outstanding, slam dunk, hang a banner. But their offense has been terrible because Dwayne Haskins has been terrible. Started the first four games, was benched, not just benched, put down to third string not given the opportunity until quarterback injuries forced him to start in week 15. And he played like ass. Then, after not even winning, just covering the number in that game, he parties maskless with strippers, gets fined $40,000, and is stripped of his captaincy with the team. Then, after that, after being a complete embarrassment to the franchise, has to start again in week 16 due to injuries at the quarterback position, and then is benched in that game for Taylor Heineke, which I wasn't even convinced was an NFL player until I saw him suit up. I, this is such a tough situation for him. You, he declined to talk to reporters right after the game, then goes home and opts to get, jump in on Zoom, probably with his camera off. Everyone knows that meeting, okay? Everyone's had the Zoom meeting with the camera off and, and talks to them and says, this has been the hardest week of my life and has to reset and all those things. And, and you feel bad for the kid. He's a young kid in the NFL. I'm not trying to bag on him, but this is such a tough situation for Dwayne Haskins and an even tougher situation for the Washington football team who's currently projected to potentially make the playoffs depending on how Sunday night football goes or be picking outside the top 15 with the quarterback situation where they desperately need an upgrade, what's the best case scenario for one, Dwayne Haskins, and two, the Washington football team? Tresh, before you start here, also just announced he's not starting on Sunday. No! As of as of when we're recording right now, per my uh, group text message with a lot of Ohio State fans. That doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Taylor Heineke came in and actually was playing well. They probably win that football game if Taylor Heineke gets to start originally. But now he's benched for Taylor Heineke and back-to-back. That's just incredible to see. Tresh, now answer the question. (laughs) What's the best-case scenario for for Haskins? And what's the best-case scenario for the football team? Yeah, Taylor Heineke played better than Dwayne Haskins ever ever had in his NFL career on Sunday. And, you know, I wanted to get him the benefit of the doubt, you know, when he had that little party scene. Maybe he just wanted the Lou Will special. Then we saw pictures. It was just bad. It was an absolute (laughs) disaster. Um, I mean... Like Sam Donald, you got to dump him at this point, you know, 
And for Washington football team, best case scenario, they lose next weekend, Sunday night football, improve that draft position, get one of those top four quarterbacks because there is a little bit of a steep drop off there. You know, they can improve their draft position significantly with the loss. And let's be honest here. Are they, they're not making a run in the playoffs. They're not even going to make no. it a close game. They're you starting know. Taylor Heineke. Exactly. Trash. <laughs> exactly. Lose the game. They, you know, you, they have to do this, the benefit of the franchise long term. I mean, I don't think it's going to happen because the Philadelphia Eagles are, you know, not the best team either, like any any other NFC East team. But it's time to cut ties with Dwayne Haskins. You know, we, we saw this last year and we're seeing it again this year. He's just not really, you know, there were some concerns coming out of Ohio State. His PFF grade was not all that great for a college guy, mm-hmm. you know, in the in Ohio State system. Yeah, really, it was like an 81 or 82.0 grade. And we've seen Justin Fields light that on fire in the following year. And even in this year where it hasn't been as good for Justin Fields, still having a far better season than Dwayne Haskins ever produced in a similar system with Olave, with Terry McLaurin, with Paris Campbell. Like, it, again, exactly. the, the, I mean, like, the just, writing was on the wall. I mean, Justin Fields shit the bed against Indiana Northwestern. He still has a great above 92.0 for the season. <laughs> I mean, that just goes to show Dwayne Haskins maybe was not all that great in that system. So, like Sam Darnold, dump him, time to cut ties. Yeah. I mean, even I think he's even in a worse spot than Sam Darnold because okay. I think Sam Darnold is a capable backup, if, ne- if not a reclamation project for another football team, if not the Jets, after they bring in a, uh, a quarterback at two. For Haskins, he doesn't have a spot on this team. Like, he is, he is completely ruined any relationship he could probably have with Ron Rivera and the rest of his teammates. I think he's on his way out of Washington, and we might see a Josh Rosen situation on our hands where – no one wants to touch this guy. No one wants to bring him in. He's he's bouncing up and down off of not stripper poles, but practice squads <laughs> and, and struggling to find it. I And again, I'm not trying to bag on the guy. It's been a bad situation where he's underperformed both on and off the field. He needs to reset this offseason, come back, and prove that he can win it. Because I think Dwayne Haskins, like we like we said with his pre-draft evaluation, the tools are there. He can put it to, If he can put it all together on and off the field, be a capable starter in the NFL. Has yet to do that so far, and it's going to take... Probably multiple teams swinging the bat on Haskins, giving him opportunities to build himself back up before we see him starting the uh, starting in the NFL again. Um, moving forward now to Mitch Trubisky. Uh, this is an interesting situation. The Chicago Bears are in a position that if they beat the Green Bay Packers, who will not be resting their starters, they have to win that game to get the number one overall seed. Or they don't have to, but they they kind of need to. There's there's other ways they can get the number one seed, but they really want to win the uh, win this Week 17 game against Mitch Trubisky. If the Bears win that one, they're in the playoffs. If they lose, they're out. There's a chance that they win that football game and the Chicago Bears faithful that was ready to throw Mitchell Trubisky and his entire family out on the road wants him back for an extension to be the starter in Chicago. One, can you believe that? And two, is that the right move? I think this is crazier than the Jets keeping Sam Darnold and drafting Penny Sewell number two. I mean, <laughs> I mean, looking at what he's done over these last few weeks, like the offense has been efficient. They've looked good. I mean, they scored 30 points. You know, we, we've all seen that stat a million times at this point. You know, the four straight games with 30 points. I mean, they've had the sixth most efficient passing offense over the last four weeks. Trubisky, on the other hand, ranks 27th among quarterbacks in PFF grade. Oh, the past three weeks? Passing grade, four weeks. And so... That kind of insinuates there's a little bit of luck involved, and he's being helped out by his playmakers a great deal. And you watch the game, that's exactly what's happened. I mean, this past week in particular, you know, it was one of the largest discrepancies we've seen from a passing efficiency standpoint in a quarterback passing grade. I mean, he Mitchell Trubisky had the fourth to last negatively graded throw weight this week, this uh, weekend against the Jacksonville Jaguars, the worst defense. <laughs> he threw the hail mary from the 20 yard line <laughs> with a with, with over 30 seconds left in the half. On first down into quintuple coverage. And he had another dropped interception outside of that. I mean, he's gotten incredibly lucky with a lot of those throws in recent weeks. And looking at, you know, what this passing offense has done in the last four weeks, this is the schedule they faced. I mean, the past defense they faced ranked 23rd, 30th, 31st, and 32nd in EPA per play allowed. I mean, people... <laughs> I think, you know, Bears fans are just trying to commit themselves that the franchise is not completely screwed, mm-hmm. um, but they are. And especially if they sign Trubisky and stick with them 2021, it's going to be a disaster. I mean, they have to just kind of cut ties, dump them like Darnold, like Haskins, dump the guy. I feel like I'm on The Bachelor at, at this point. Dump <laughs> no him. rose, no rose. Yeah, no rose for this guy. You know, And I think the situation would be different, though, if Chicago, I, I obviously it would. This is not even, this is a cold take, but the situation would be a lot different Sit, the if they were in a position to take a quarterback but the fact that they're going to be they're uh, projected to pick 20th like they're not going to be in a position to take one of those top five guys the jet situation is completely different like they're 
really bad, but their quarterback's kind of playing well of late. But, like, they're so bad that you probably need to take a quarterback. With the Bears, it's like, oh, well, we can't really get one in the first round. Maybe Trubisky is it. Maybe just a one-year deal. I think that's maybe part of the reason how they're convincing themselves. But it's still bad. You know, I, I do think they might be in a position to get Mac Jones, possibly, which I, I think would be a great option for him. But I don't think they're going to do that. Yeah. You know, I, well, it also depends on what happens to Ryan Pace, because if he sticks in town, I do not think that's going to happen. But if mm-hmm. they start to clean house a little bit, because I mean, Mac, Matt Nagy is going to stay for next year, but it depends on the front office situation. If the front office gets cleaned out, Mitch Trubisky's done. Yeah. Like there's no exactly. way, there's no way the front office in their first season's like, this is who we're hanging our hat on in our first season. I think they try and make moves in free agency, maybe try and trade for a quarterback, or like you said, a Kyle Trask, Mac Jones in the first round. I got an idea. Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan's an option. With Matt Nagy, I think would be fantastic. Exactly. And we'll get into what the Atlanta Falcons should do later because they are in an incredible situation. An incredible situation. All right. Um, I think another thing I wanted to bring up, over the past four weeks, the only quarterbacks that have graded worse than Mitchell Tubisky. And, and this is 2018 all over again. Mitchell Tubisky played well from a box score perspective. Pass rating was great, QBR, whatever you wanted. But turnover-worthy plays mounted up. Negatively graded throws mounted up. And as everyone wanted to you know, hate on PFF, and I've always said, don't use PFF as a lone data point. But a lot of times, specifically at the quarterback position, I think pass rusher is very good, offensive line, defensive line, grades have predictive power, and we've seen that time and time again. And on, oftentimes, do a better job of predict or not uh, describing player performance, specifically at the quarterback position. Over the past four weeks, the only QBs that have graded worse than Mitch Trubisky are Sam Darnold, Nick Mullins, Jalen Hurts, Big Ben, and Dwayne Haskins. It's not good company, and as good as the box score has looked, it's time to cut ties with Mitch Trubisky. Last situation I want to bring up before we dive into our top performing rookies and then our top 10 mock draft is one that is a harder harder conversation. I think our first three, Darnold, Haskins, and Trubisky, it's like, leave them. It's over. Trying to make an upgrade at the quarterback position. This next one... Is more of a conversation. Tua Tungavailoa and Ryan Fitzpatrick, Ryan Fitzpatrick being the closer, Tua Tungavailoa being the starter, are potentially in a position to make the playoffs in the AFC with a very good defense and a coach of the year candidate in Brian Flores, if not the favorite to win it, especially after Kevin Stefanski just laid an egg against the New York Jets. I think, what do they do? Because they have the Houston Texans first round pick, which is currently slated to pick third. So the Dolphins are gonna would be picking third if the season ended today in a position to get Wilson or Fields or Lance in the top five if they wanted to swing the bat at the quarterback position again. Is it that simple? Is Tua Tungvaluwa not shown enough to where you want to make that decision? Or, hey, pump the brakes. He just came off an injury. He wasn't even slated to start the season. Let's give him some more time. Let's grab a day solo at three. Let's grab the best non-quarterback available. Hold your horses, man. We're building around Tua. Yeah, you know, I think what I would do, and I know what you would do, and everyone else mostly, you know, our coworkers would do, is swing the bat, take a quarterback. It's not going to happen. There, I mean, there's no chance that's going to happen. But I think, you know, give yourself a best chance to, you know, hit a home run at the most important position on the field. And that's not, I'm not saying this because I don't think Tua Tungvalu is going to be, you know, not a quality starter or a franchise quarterback. I think he will. Granted, he, I mean, he has not been good this year. Mm-hmm. And if we're talking right now what they need to do moving forward, Tua Tungvaluwa should go back to the bench, put Ryan Fitzpatrick in. If you actually want to make a you know a postseason run, I don't think it's going to happen. But if you want to give yourselves the best shot at winning, it's Ryan Fitzpatrick. I mean, he came in against the Raiders for relief. 13 passes, had two big-time throws. Tua Tungvaluwa this year, 232 passes, four big-time throws. That is the worst rate in the NFL. I mean, when you're looking at their passing efficiency with Fitzpatrick, Sixth in the NFL with Tua Tungavala, 22nd. Oh, my God. Exactly. I mean, if you actually want to give your your team the best chance to win right now, make a run in the postseason, you have to start Ryan Fitzpatrick. And then in the offseason, because they're not going to win the Super Bowl, you know, they're I mean, we, we they should have Bill O'Brien as an honorary honorary staff member because he's really helped him out. For the, this <laughs> just don't season. let him take the pick, please. Exactly. Yeah, you just let him sit in the corner, watch, and just say thank you, Bill. Um, but yeah, you take Justin Fields or Zach Wilson, whoever is there at number three, and you know, best case scenario, one of them hits, and then you can trade the other one. You have mm-hmm. a blue chip trade asset. Yep, I, I'm with you 100. percent And I, I think let's start with what they should do right now. I think Ryan Fitzpatrick should be the starter right now. Stop this freaking garbage of starting to uh, just for him to blow the lead and then bring in Ryan Fitzpatrick to make a big time throw with his face mask being pulled up his head. There's no chance Tua Tungvaluwa makes that throw. No, if, if there's his zero. Face mask, his, if his face mask is getting pulled off like that, he's going to the ground. There's just zero chance. Ryan Fitzpatrick is a rare breed. He's Fitz Magic for a reason. Fitzpatrick should be the starter if you want to go to the playoffs and try and make some make some waves. 
if you want to see what you have in Tua Tungvaloa and, and kind of throw the season out, really, you start him and you continue to collect data points on Tua Tungvaloa to verify whether or not you want to move forward with him. As for what they do with the number three overall pick, which they're currently slated to get, it's not guaranteed that they're picking number three, depending on how week 17 shakes out. My opinion is it's it, it's very similar to the Jets' second worst scenario. It's either trade out of that pick because there are other teams that want to get a quarterback, either Wilson or Fields at three, or take the quarterback. It, it, it does not make sense to stay put at three when you're going to have teams like the Lions, the Panthers, the Broncos, all drafting inside the top 10, itching to try and get their hands on one of the top three quarterbacks in this draft. Do not stay put to take who you think is the best non-quarterback in this draft. Do not be overconfident in your evaluation. We've seen time and time again people be overconfident in their evaluation and lose out to other better players at that same position in later rounds. I think that is the situation I'm currently favoring for the Miami Dolphins. Take a quarterback at three or trade out of that pick. Gather more picks because you have another first-round pick as well, your original first-round pick. Gather more picks to fill needs on that roster and, and, and make moves that way. If you're if you're not willing to move on from Tua Tonga Bailoa or have a or have a quarterback come in and compete with Tua Tonga Bailoa, I I could see a possible Mitchell Trubisky draft moment here. But I, I mean, I think yes. it's going to turn out better mm-hmm. for you know. Let's say the Atlanta Falcons are there at number four. You know, they're the new GM coming in wants a new quarterback. I think they could. Miami could possibly swindle them into a lot of picks because maybe they can, you know, throw some smoke screens out there. Because if this draft or older, uh, if this draft order holds, I think we're going to see a lot of oh, Miami's thinking about taking a quarterback here just to get that trade assets, you know, building up. I could see the Atlanta Falcons, you know, just saying screw it, let's give up some picks, secure that number three spot. They can move back to that four spot, takes Penny Sewell or Jamar Chase, and have a bunch of other picks right there for him. So, yeah, I mean, they're in a really good situation. Shout out to Bill O'Brien. Yeah, <laughs> shout out to Bill O'Brien. All right, let's now move to our top performing rookies in the NFL. That was a great conversation, by the way. I, I, I think it's important. In the offseason, the biggest the biggest thing to talk about is what do people do at the quarterback position. And I think this one in particular is interesting because, one, you have a lot of teams that should be looking to make an upgrade at the quarterback position. And two, one of the deepest quarterback classes we've really seen in the NFL draft for quite some time. Like There might be six that go in the first round, including Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Justin Fields, Trey Lance, Max Jones, and potentially Kyle Trask. Potentially Kyle Trask. Who knows? We'll see how it goes. But five or six quarterbacks could be going in the first round. That's how deep and how talented this class is. So the offseason is going to shake out don't, to be... Don't forget about my guy, Jamie Newman. And not going to forget two. about Jamie Newman. I'm not going to forget about Desmond Ritter. Some people are big okay. on Desmond Ritter. Okay. Some people love Desmond Ritter out of University I'll of forget Cincinnati. about Desmond Ritter. Um, all right, looking at our top performing rookies, this past week, got T. Higgins. T. Higgins, the Cincinnati wideout, drafted in the second round out of Clemson with a 33 overall pick, the number one pick in the second round. He's been quietly very, very good, despite a very up-and-down quarterback situation with Cincinnati. Broke Chris Collinsworth, boss Chris Collinsworth record, Bengals franchise record for single-season receptions by a rookie receiver. That with 67 receptions this past week. Had arguably the best game of his career, caught six of nine targets for 99 yards and a touchdown. And let's let's talk about the touchdown. One of the best touchdowns by any rookie wide receiver this season. Great toe drag swag on the side there. T. Higgins, I think, is comfortably slotting himself to replace A.J. Green as that bigger possession receiver that can win down the field, win on vertical routes in this offense for Joe Burrow and company next year. That, I think, has to be an awesome development that Cincinnati Bengals faithful should be excited about in 2021. Exactly, and he was strong at the catch point, and you know he's been very consistent in that regard. And that's what that was his bread and butter at Clemson. I mean, is, is he going to be better than the boss Chris Collinsworth for the Cincinnati Bengals over the course of their career? I won't say it. I'm not either. I'm not going to say it either. I'm a, <laughs> we I'm need to decided. get him on the pod, or at the very least, Chris's exactly. pod, and have him glow to his face. We I have to get T T Higgins and Chris on the pod and have them duke it out. I, I like that idea. But also, Brandon Allen. Can we talk about the quarterback play? Dude, he's been good. I mean, he was good this past week. He has been good. No. This was a great game for Brandon Allen. He blacked out. And he showed up <laughs> this game blacked out and just played out of his mind. Five big-time throws, no turnover where he plays. But that that catch, I mean, it probably would have been the play of the week if it weren't for Fitzpatrick just being Fitzpatrick with that, yeah. you know, that, that dime and the cover two hole. All righty then. Let's see. Next here is A.J. Dillon. I mean, you have to bring it up. Six... <laughs> I, he's listed at six foot two fifty. No. Yes, he is. He's an absolute monster, and he looks like one. Everyone's saying he's got Derrick Henry vibes and all that stuff. And honestly, let's call it what it is. I still don't like the value at number sixty-two overall, the second-round pick out of Boston College. But they drafted him for this game. 
they drafted him to play in December in the snow where t- where everything's a lot harder to do and tackling big dudes like AJ Dillon is not fun. And he wore him down. I mean, the guy had over 90 yards after contact, forced more than five, six missed tackles. Best game easy of his career. I mean, he's barely even played before this game. 78.7 overall grade. I, I-, I was qu- not 78.7. Sorry, it was better than that. Am I high? No, it was a 78.7 overall grade. I apologize. But A.J. Dillon played really well in this game. Big highlight for him. Green Bay Packers are stoked on it. Yeah, I'm proud of A.J. Dillon for what he did on the field. I'm not proud of the Lambo leaps. You know, I, there was some... I think I could have made that Lambo leap. The A.J. Dillon leaps were bad. It was. I mean, there it might have been slippery. Who knows? There's some good excuses he could have there. But yeah, I mean, overall, it was a good game on the ground. Like you said, I think it was still a very bad pick. I mean, that's no disrespect to A.J. Dillon. That's just the position he plays. You know, mm-hmm. you, you, it was a little bit of a reach, um, but it was overall still a good night for him. I, uh, I'm, I'm excited to see him continue to get some carries, you know, because, I mean, it, 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 the, it, the bottom line is he's just, like, wrecking kids. I mean, he's just, like, bullying kids in that game against the Tennessee Titans in the snow. A.J. Dillon, what a I'm excited treat. for more Lambo leaps. Yeah, we, we, I'm ex- you have to be excited for more Lambo leaps. I need to correct this grade. I think I was wrong here. Let me double check what this grade was here. I don't want to misquote. Yeah, it's an 82.8 overall grade in this game, an 82.8 PFF rushing grade against the Tennessee Titans. Forced nine missed tackles, gained over 90 yards after contact. Have yourself a day, AJ Dillon. All right, next rookie on the list here is Derek Brown, a guy we haven't brought up on the podcast in a while. He had a rough start to the season, went against the Las Vegas Raiders and that insane interior offensive line that's played. You know, really well when Richie Incognito was healthy for the first few games. But even since then, you've seen him quietly improve. And I thought originally he was earning very, very low grades, a 32.8 grade in week one, 33.0 in week two, but then has a 29.0 grade in week five. He's getting bullied against the run. I mean, he was getting he was getting tag teamed against the run. A lot of double teams and struggling to handle it as a rookie with an abbreviated offseason and no preseason. But there have been signs of life, specifically as a pass rusher. Over the past one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Over the past eight games, in seven of them, he's had three or more pressures. Like he is getting after the passer, not a very high pass rushing grade, but still pushing the pocket as this interior defensive lineman. I, I do think he's played a lot better of late, and I think a highlight for sure coming off one of the best pass rushing performances of the season. Yeah, I mean, I've been he's I mean, he's surpassed my expectations as as a pass rusher. Absolutely. I mean, the run defense has been, like you said, a, a little shaky. You know, it, it could be a lot better than what it's been. But, I mean, like you said, he's been productive as a pass rusher, playing at pretty much every position on the line in every single game. Um, I, I think that's pretty impressive. A 73.3 pass rush grade, like you said, or a rookie, limited offseason. Um, and, and, two, seeing some reps there at nose tackle and being productive there. Um, so, I, I've been impressed with Derek Brown. I mean, he's definitely, I think the best way to phrase this is he's exceeded my expectations. I didn't expect him to have games with multiple games with three-plus pressures. Seven of his last eight games with three-plus pressures. And not everyone's going to be Aaron Donald, okay? Not everyone's going to have a pass rush grade above 90, like what Grady Jarrett can do, what Kenny Clark, what Aaron Donald can do on the interior, Chris Jones. But if he's consistently pushing the pocket, consistently pursuing the passer, like that's what you ask from the big boys like Derek Brown, guys that are supposed to two-gap, hold down in the run, and then push the pocket as interior pass rushers. He's doing that. As a rookie, again, with no in a, in a season where there's only one defensive rookie in the NFL with a grade above 65.0 because of how hard it's been to transition from college to the NFL with COVID impacting the season, and it's Chase Young. Derek Brown, not at that level yet, but still playing a lot better of late. I think you have to tip your cap to him. Another player playing really well of late, now that he's actually getting snaps, <laughs> is um, Willie Gay Jr., Played a career-high 49 defensive snaps against the Atlanta Falcons and earned an 85.2 PFF grade and an 87.0 run defense grade. Six defensive stops. Six defensive stops. And stops, according to PFF's method, is when you make a tackle that constitutes in a loss for the offense. Six defensive stops in this game. I think a really, really impressive performance for him. I think Willie Gay Jr. was someone we really liked coming out. All the athleticism in the world, off-field concerns, kept him out the football field at Mississippi State. He's on the football field now for Kansas City and looking like their best off-ball linebacker, dare I say it, their best off-ball linebacker. 100%. And, you know, outside of the off-field stuff, the run defense was kind of the the big thing we were worried about right out of the gate. You know, I mean, he had NFL coverage ability. You, know, you could see it when he was on the field in college. And, you know, I mean, his run defense was absolutely out, outstanding. He had four run stops, two tackles for loss, like you said. Um, so I, I think he's going to be... Top top ten off ball linebacker down the road. I think he has the He's capability. Got that potential. I think he has the capability of being that. Over the past three weeks, playing significant snaps for the Kansas City Chiefs, 
Willie Gay Jr. I'm looking it up right now. Give me a second. All right, this is a big one. God damn it. Help me. We'll get there. Has struggle. Speaking the of the best grade at the linebacker position over the past three weeks. 90.2 PFF grade over the past three weeks. Best in best in the NFL. That's how well he's played over the past three weeks. I mean, I think it's ceiling. I think he could be elite, an elite guy. I think he could be, you know, here in a few years. I'm not expecting it next year right out of the way, mm -hmm. but I could see him having that Fred Warner esque, you know, third year leap mm -hmm. to elite status like Fred Warner has had this year. I mean, he's been incredible this year for the San Francisco 49ers. Fred Warner and Drew Greenlaw have both been yeah. really good. Like they have, they do a really, really good job of attacking athletes at that position. And we were having this conversation in the office recently, and I, I hate to go off on a tangent, but. You talk, we talk about positional value a lot on this podcast. We're talking about it a lot in the office here at PFF. Off-ball linebacker is not of high positional value. You, it is very, I think uh, the biggest reason is it's, it's somewhat of a position that can be overlooked on very good defenses, and you can still have a very good defense. Like, I don't think you need elite off-ball linebacker play to have that great defense. You look at some of the best defenses in the NFL this year, they have not had elite linebacker play. I think the Giants come to mind when they were on their, their streak. The football team is another one who's starting Cole Holcomb and John Bostick and still managing to have a really good defense. Pittsburgh Steelers have had the best defense in the NFL for most of this year and have not had elite linebacker play in quite some time. While the defenses that do have these elite linebackers, Seattle Seahawks, one of the worst defenses in the NFL. Minnesota Vikings with Eric Kendricks and Anthony Barr, one of the worst defenses in the NFL. I don't think it's a position that you need to target highly. And on the defensive side of the ball, one of the more lower valuable positions but I think where you swing the bat on that position is day two, day three, trying to identify athletes, guys that can move sideline to sideline with great speed and then try and fill them in and try and teach them that position and move forward from there. I think that's where you find value. Similar to finding valuable interior defensive linemen, you can find those guys on day two, day three, guys that can stuff the run and be those big boys up front and not necessarily attack those guys at the top of the draft. All right. They are the running backs of the defense side of the I, this, I would agree. This is a topic you are very passionate about. I think I've heard you go off on a rant about off-ball linebackers three times in the last four days. I mean, I am very I love it, though. It. I'm here for it. I, I do think it. they're the running backs on the defensive side of the ball. I, I do think that they're the lowest valuable position on the defensive side of the ball. All right. Looking at Chase Young, guy who's coming off the best game of his career. 93.7 PFF grade, 92.0 pass rushing grade, five total pressures, a career high, five total pressures in this game. Also had... Um, just just an absolute monster off the edge, both as a run defender and as a pass rusher, is now the third-ranked rookie edge defender in PFF history behind, I think, what was Alden Smith and Von Miller. An absolute insane season, and every which way we expected it since day one. I mean, this is a guy who was supposed to enter the NFL and be as good as he is now. Yeah, I mean, I kind of felt bad for Trent Scott. He just could not handle the the blend of power and quickness from Chase Young. I mean, he pretty much lined up across from him exclusively in this game. Trent Scott, 27.3 pass block grade for the game. I mean, that's a poor one out right there. It is. We have, we have our official poor one out coming up here after we talk Tristan Wirfs, but I do think uh, that's that's not a great move. Yeah. Uh, not a great look for Trent Scott. Tristan Wirfs, though, you go, go ahead and take, take off here. Tristan Wirfs should be the offensive rookie of the year. Won't be because he plays offensive tackle. But I do think he's been far and away one of the best picks of the draft so far this year, starting for a team that's just coming off a blowout win over the Patri uh, the Lions that is going to be competing for a Super Bowl this year. Yeah, I don't think he should be the offensive rookie of the year. I think Justin Hater. Jefferson, I, I think he, I think he's well-deserved of that just because looking at all the rookie wide receiver seasons we've seen, I mean, the only one that's really surpassed Justin Jefferson is OBJ. Uh, but Tristan Wirfs, I would do think he should be the clear-cut second over Justin Herbert. Um, I mean, he had his fifth best PFF grade of his rookie campaign on Saturday against the Detroit Lions. Um, now the third highest graded right tackle in the NFL at 81.7. I think he at is... At 21 years old. Exactly. <laughs> and the thing is, I think right now, at this very moment, he is one of the 10 best tackles in the entire league. Wow. 21 years old as a rookie. I think he has a potential to be an easy top three, maybe one of the, the best tackle here in a few years. Damn. I mean, I, I mean, it's high praise, but it's well warranted. Because not only has he graded really well, he's been very, very consistent, specifically in pass protection. He doesn't have a single game pass blocking grade under 64. This season, as a rookie, without without an offseason prepare, with no preseason, like that doesn't make sense. Like that, that shouldn't be a thing. Like we see, we talk about it all the time. Rookie offensive tackles are not supposed to enter the NFL and have this level of success. We talk about not drafting for need at that position, 
because you rarely see this level of success. The Bucks, you saw on that that video that came out shortly after, tried to trade up to go get them. They're trying to trade up with everyone. They finally trade up with like one or two spots and grab Tristan Wirfs to fill this need on what was a Super Bowl roster with Tom Brady under center. And they did so, and it's panning out. I mean, this is you rarely see a plan work to perfection like this, but the Buccaneers hit a home run with Tristan Wirfs. Yeah, absolute I mean, home run. Ever, ever since Khalil Mack threw him, He's been a completely like I mean he was good to start out the year, but ever since that moment he's just been on point. I think that did was you listen his... to the two for one drafts where we had him on? I did, but it's been a long time. So we, we had him on. Good answer. I, <laughs> we we had him on, and I talked about we talked to him about the Khalil Mack throw. You go back and listen to that episode if you haven't. It's really good. Um, and he says, "Yeah, I never seen that happen before." But he has a wrestling background. He's like, "It's a wrestling move, whatever." And I was like, "Did you talk to Khalil Mack after that? After that, what well, was a crazy game? They were going toe to toe the entire game, and he he won some reps. Khalil obviously won some reps. He's like, "Nope, didn't say anything." That's crazy to me. You had going toe to toe with like a future. I mean, maybe he's not a future Hall of Famer, but I mean, maybe he is. Khalil Mack. What? I think Khalil Mack should be a future Hall of Famer. Not everyone's on board with that. I think everyone is. I mean, if they, if no one is, that's that's Darnold Penny Sewell type of, you know. <laughs> well, anyway, going against a future yeah. Hall of Fame edge defender as a rookie and having the, the, the bout that they had, I thought at least they'd exchange some words. But Khalil Mack kind of cold shoulder him, I guess. Um, interesting situation with Tristan Wurst. But since that throw, I mean, he's been stunning in pass protection. All right, let's do our blackout segment here. Jerry Judy, wide receiver for the Denver Broncos. First round pick. Had his lowest graded game of the season, and rightfully so. Dude had five drops. Five drops in a single game is the most we've seen in five years. And he's getting open. He's creating separation. He's earning those targets. But drops were a small concern coming out of Alabama. He had some drops. You know, He attacked the ball inconsistently in some ways. But you, drops are noisy. Drops are inconsistent. Drops are volatile. This can't happen, though. You can't drop the ball five times in a game. This one's got to be one where you black out. You pour one out. You try to forget this day and restart. Because I still think Jerry Judy is going to be a successful receiver in this league once the Denver Broncos make an upgrade at the quarterback position and some of these drops kind of positively regress. But bad performance for Jerry Judy. Yeah, I mean, he, arguably he was the biggest contributor to that loss. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean in, a three, in a three-point loss, five drops – We'll fucking do it. I mean, that, exactly. that's, when, that's bad news. When Drew Locks your quarterback too, you have to make the most of every single catchable ball you get downfield. Um, you know, I'm not too concerned with this. Obviously, it's not good. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he's definitely been a disappointment this season. But if you told me that he ends up being the best wide receiver out of this rookie class, I would not be surprised because the man is a filthy route runner. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, create separation runner. with the best fun for sure. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and jump to our top 10 mock draft. This is going to be fun. Just discussing scenarios, discussing options, top 10 mock draft, where it currently sits after this break. <sighs> top 10 NFL mock draft here, starting with the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I, I, in previous times, talking about mocking, you know, doing mock drafts and stuff, I always skip by the Jacks. I'm taking Trevor Lawrence, it's over. I want to spend a little time here. The obvious pick is Trevor Lawrence at number one overall. Where the conversation starts, I think, is how do they also leverage other draft capital? Because they have another first round pick and significant cap resource and some existing pieces to build around. How do they build around Trevor Lawrence? What's that ideal situation? I like DJ Chark as a complimentary piece. I like LaVisca Chenault, what he's done so far this year. The offensive line still needs work. Defensively, it's very young. I mean, outside of Miles Jack, there isn't like a stellar star veteran on this team. Josh Allen has developed as a pass rusher, but still not the guy they maybe wanted him to be in this year. How do the Jags build around Trevor Lawrence? What are some other pieces they add? Maybe another first round with their other first round pick or attack in the offseason? I mean, would I be crazy to say that they should go wide receiver with that second pick? I mean, not at all. There's going to be some talented wide receivers there, possibly available to them. And, you know, right now they're picking 21st. Um, that's subject to change. It's going to change um, in the coming weeks. But, you know, if they can get someone maybe like Rondale Moore, Rashad Bateman um, with that second pick, I feel like you have to take it. Mm -hmm. And also, too, I've seen a lot of, I'm not going to name names, but a lot of people in NFL media saying, take the pick away. What they're, The fans, they're so wrong. They should not be cheering to lose. The Jack, Jacksonville Jaguars need to be winning every game they can. They should not be deliberately losing, throwing out Mike Glennon to start an NFL game when he really should not be. Why? I mean, I find it more enjoyable watching teams try to lose mm -hmm. than having bad teams try to win games. Because, I mean, they're setting them, themselves up for success in the long term because if they did not get this first overall pick, I mean, I, they're still probably gonna, they would still probably be in a position to get one of the other two quarterbacks. But we're talking about our top prospect we have ever seen. Right now, probably, I, I think it's a toss-up between him and Joe Burrow. But compared to everyone else, I mean, 
I, I just do not understand why people do not like tanking. You know, I wouldn't be mad if we went to the lottery system. Mm -hmm. I think that's an interesting thing. We were talking about it before the pod. We started recording. Do a lottery system for the first round, then revert back to the worst record in rounds two through seven. I just had to get that off my chest because I, I keep seeing it pop up on Twitter that this is bad for the game, deliberately losing the fans, you know, cheering for the Chicago Bears mm -hmm. to score and beat them to clinch that first overall pick. I, I love it. I think it's good for the sport. I don't think my, it's my take is, is it's not... It's not the fault. It's not on the fault of the Jaguars. It's on the fault that there isn't a lottery system. Like if you put a situation or a system in place where you benefit from losing, specifically late in the season, like the Jags, you're you should lose. Like that. that what's the point? I mean, this is this is a game where we're trying to win football games. The best way the Jets Jags win future football games, go to the postseason in the future where they're already eliminated, is to lose that football game and grab the best quarterback prospect we've seen in the past five years. Maybe since Andrew Luck, Joe Burrow, whoever you want it to be. I think a lottery system make, would make a ton of sense. Put that out of the, you know, push that out of the picture. But even then, you have teams trying to lose football games for better picks or better odds in the lottery, whatever it may be. I, I think the bottom line is, you know, when the Jags fans should have been cheering for wins, fucking ten weeks ago, fifty. Well, by the time you're out of playoff contention, why aren't you rooting for a better pick? You know, and here's the other issue is that. Players don't tank. Players are playing for roster bonuses. Players are playing for future jobs, specifically Mike Glennon and half the Jaguars team. Like, it's not – the players are going out there to try and win every single game. You know what I mean? So I, I, don't, I still think you can have that rooting interest in watching teams. And I think Eric has said this before. The game is too violent to go out there and not play your best football to try and get a better pick. Like, the game is too violent for that. Right. Like, you can do it in the NBA, whatever, whatever you want. I mean, I'm not saying the NBA isn't violent. Well, he's up, guys. He's up. It's a contact sport. But, like – you're literally like going toe to toe with people in the NFL. I don't think right. it's too. I think it's too violent for players to like not put out their best effort. Can right. They be underprepared, sure, but uh, and, and when I say that, I mean starting Mike Glennon. Yeah. Because, I mean, because like Gardner Minshew and resting James Robinson. I mean, there's there's part of that too. Exactly. But I, like I, I, you, yeah. it, clearly, Gardner Minshew would have given him the best shot to win this game in in, in any other game. What know? do the Jags do with Gardner Minshew? He's got to be the backup behind Trevor. I think he's a quality backup. I think he's one of the better backups in the NFL. Top three backup. <laughs> I freaking love Garner Mitchell. All right, let's jump to the Jags. It's, I mean, the Jets. It's obvious the Jaguars are taking Trevor Lawrence. And, uh oh, a free agent signing was going to bring up maybe Taylor Moton, who's played really well for offensive tackle for the Carolina Panthers and I think a guy that's going to get paid a shitload of money this year. They don't have a ton of talent at offensive tackle. Cam Robinson and Jawan Taylor haven't been outstanding for them. It's one of the bigger needs on offense. That could be a piece they add in free agency. There's also good wide receivers in free agency. Do they bring back Allen Robinson? Oh, gosh. Bring back Allen Robinson. Because he could play with Trevor Lawrence. That sounds kind of hot. Or Will Fuller, who's going to have a, what, a game suspension for the PADs. If the Chicago Bears let Allen Robinson walk and bring back Mitchell Trubisky, sell the team. Move the team. <laughs> Move the team. I actually love a, re, a, a reuniting, a, a reunion, reuniting, a reunion of Allen Robinson to Jacksonville with an actual good quarterback in Trevor Lawrence. I actually really like that. I'd be interested in Oh, I do Allen too. Robinson's I mean, sake. that would be very hot. Um, moving to the New York Jets. We've already had this conversation. We kind of move kind of quickly here. It's take the best of Zach Wilson or Justin Fields. Whoever your evaluators, the guys you pay, you know, X thousands of dollars to evaluate players in the draft, whoever they think is the best quarterback, Joe Douglas thinks is the best quarterback, you take them at number two overall. I don't think it's close. 100%. Let's get off the Jets. Yeah. I'm done with the Jets. Yeah, right. Moving to the Dolphins at three. And we've had this conversation It's crack as well. talk if you think they're <laughs> drafting Pene Sewell and keeping Sam Darnold. Come on. The Dolphins, we've had this, we had this conversation at the top of the podcast, but I think either stay put at three and take a quarterback if you feel that, say, say the Jets do take Wilson, if the Dolphins front office feels that Justin Fields gives them a better opportunity to win football games than Tua Tungavailoa, you take him. It's not close. It's not close. If you're like, ah, I don't know, I think Tua Tungavailoa is a better prospect than Fields, then the conversation's over. If your front office, again, these guys you pay thousands, millions of dollars to evaluate you know, prospects, if they're like, no, Tua is a better prospect than Justin Fields, then you don't take Justin Fields. You try and trade out for a team that does like Justin Fields, gather more draft capital to fill the freaking countless needs on this roster. But if your front office says no, in a, in a neutral situation, I think Fields is the better player, you fucking take him. Like, that's obvious. If you think there's a better quarterback in your lap, you take them regardless of where you've invested in the previously, previously at the position. Yeah, and if you don't, you trade down. Yeah, you have to trade because you know Pene Sewell's great, but there are a lot of other great tackles in this class. Mm -hmm. You can get you can get some later. And if you trade down, I mean, I would love to see you know first and foremost, Justin Fields is probably the best option here. But a Tua Tung Viola, Devonta Smith, or Jalen Waddle reunion that would be that, that's my dream right there. Jalen Waddle, if they traded out of three, maybe they got down to five or six, wherever it may be, and picked up Jalen Waddle and, and tried to really build around Tua Tung Viola. 
that would be pretty damn fun. And I think you can get a king's ransom for that third pick. Absolutely. You can get That's why it would be stupid it. to stay put and take Panay Sewell. That's why it would be stupid. You can get a king's ransom for that pick because there's a third potential number one overall quarterback pick in a different class and Justin Fields or Wilson falling to you at three. Jumping to the Falcons. This is the first situation we already haven't talked about at length. They're picking at four. Slotted to pick at four right now. It might not happen. I don't think... I don't even think it's not obvious. They they should be in the quarterback market going after a, a Fields, Wilson, or Lance here at four, depending on who falls to them. I mean, not, uh, yeah, not Lawrence. <laughs> They're not going to get Lawrence there at four. But Fields, Wilson, or Lance here at four, I think makes a ton of sense for the Falcons, even though they do have Matt Ryan. And you can move on from Matt Ryan, trade him to a team like the Bears, like you know, a team that's not or maybe the football team, San Fran. San Fran, a team that wants to make an upgrade at the quarterback position, but won't be in a position to do so in the draft. And I bet you could get a first round pick from Matt Ryan, even with his contract where it currently stands. And you do that, and you really embrace this rebuild with a new GM and a new coaching staff. That I think is the way Falcons go, especially if they're here picking it for. Yeah, I mean, I think um, most people would say the AJ Terrell dropped interception was a poor one out type of moment, you know, a very bad moment for the young rookie. Um, but I think he might have just saved the entire franchise because <laughs> they, that could very well keep them out of quarterback purgatory. That would have won them the game. They would have been picking a lot worse down where they are now. Now yeah. they're at number four. They're in a position. They're picking outside the top 10. Exactly. And now they're in a position to take a quarterback and get in. And most teams, that need a quarterback. They do not already have a quarterback that they can trade off for, a, you know, good compensation. Mm-hmm. They're in a very unique position, a good position. You know, earlier in the year, we were saying, you know, after that rough start, they should just trade away Matt Ryan at the deadline and tank. You know, that's the best thing to do. Hopefully get a shot at Trevor Lawrence. You know, I after they didn't really do that, I didn't, didn't expect them to do that. I did not expect them to actually be in a position to get one of these better quarterbacks. You take advantage of that. And, you know, I think with the new regime, I think that is something they, um, you know, they, they, they would definitely consider here. Man, it's it's an interesting situation. I remember when you wrote that article. I remember when you pitched that article early in the season. I said, ah, I don't know. Like, should they blow it up? But now, like, hindsight 2020, it's like, holy shit, they probably should have. Like, they probably should have traded Matt Ryan ahead of the deadline and tried to get a lot of value from him. I, I'm trying to pull up where Matt Ryan currently ranks among yeah, active I'm- quarterbacks and salary. But, like, I think, again, so Matt Ryan right now in, so let's like see, average now. annual value – it's like ranking just outside the top five in over the next three years, 94 million, which ranks fifth. So like he he's still a good quarterback, but when you're looking at the team as a whole, you know, mm-hmm. you'll you'll hear some people say at PFF, you know, defenses don't matter. And it's it's not that they don't matter. It's more about defenses are a product of what the offense gives them mm-hmm. and to a certain extent. And, and there's a lot of volatility because of that. Exactly. But but you, you can win with an average defense. You cannot win when you have a complete and utter liability of a defense. They looked good this past week. But, I, I mean, the Raheem off- Morris has kind of changed them a little bit. Exactly. Like they played better with Raheem Morris by a significant degree. Exactly. But I, I can't see them, you know, the, the team as a whole being in a position to win in 2021 with Matt Ryan actually be a Super Bowl contender, especially with, you know, the, divi- the shape of the division right now. Because I still think Tom Brady's probably got a year, another year left at him. Mm-hmm. He's looking pretty damn good right now. I mean, who knows what Drew Brees is going to do with the New Orleans Saints, but, you know, they're not going to be in a position to win the division next year or go to the Super Bowl next year, and at that point, you're thinking about Matt Ryan's starting that decline. I mean, it's best to jump, the, get ahead of the gun, and actually start to commit to your franchise, you know, put yourself in a position to seed for the next 10 to 15 years instead of being in that awkward position post-Matt Ryan where you don't really have a quarterback and you're just in that purgatory. Because, okay, let's think about it. They keep Matt Ryan. Hey, no, we're not getting a quarterback. We're going to add at four. We'll add pff, Jamar Chase or uh, a, a tackle, best non-quarterback, Micah Parsons, whoever the fuck you want. Are they really that much better than they are this year? No. A, a few wins better with a new coach. Say it's the best coach in the fucking, say it's Lincoln Riley or whoever you want. Like, are they objectively that much better than they are this year where they were supposed to be a contending for the playoffs no and maybe they improve by two or three wins just by like regression but like that's not where you want to be exactly i think they're in a really good position to move on from matt ryan trade him for a potentially a first round pick invest in the quarterback position in either you know, wilson fields or lance and then with that extra capital that you're saving from getting off the ryan contract build up that defense add some players and move on there because you're gonna have to pay calvin ridley here pretty soon Julio Jones is getting a little bit older. The, the offensive line is still very young. Defensively, you need a ton of resource to improve that defense. I really do think they're in a spot to be a year early on the rebuild. 
And I'm not saying completely blow it up. Don't also trade Julio Jones. Don't no. also trade Deion Jones. Like, hey, hold their horses. Move on from the most expensive player on your team, the quarterback position, where he hasn't been able to lift the, you know, the Atlanta Falcons into a deep postseason run despite their flaws. Move on from him. Gather more draft capital from it. Save that cap space and try and rebuild with a new quarterback. I think they should. Because you look at where Matt Ryan has ranked this year in PFF passing grade. 10th this year in PFF passing grade. Still very good. Still top 10 quarterback according to PFF passing grade. I still think that's not enough, especially as this team moves forward, to carry them into the postseason with how bad this roster is. And for that reason, you don't want to be consistently in this purgatory situation. I think the Matt Ryan era could be ending in Atlanta. All right, let's jump to the Cincinnati Bengals. Now projected to pick at five. We're currently expected to pick at three. The Panay Sewell sweepstakes might be over. There's still a chance that Panay Sewell falls to five. We don't know what's going to happen. No one knows what's going to happen. They can still take Panay Sewell five. And if he does, I think Panay Sewell's to pick. But if Panay Sewell is off the board, and four quarterbacks have already been taken in this situation, which would be nuts, but possible, I think they're in a position to take the best wide receiver available. Whether they like Jamar Chase to reunite with Joe Burrow, Jalen Waddell, who's the most dynamic athlete, most explosive dude in this class, or Devontae Smith, arguably the most productive over the past two years. I think they take the best weapon available. Am I wrong there? If Panay Sewell is off the board. No, not at all. And, you know, I think that's the the right move to make and I think they would go Jamar Chase just because of Joe Burrow and I mean that connection was I mean completely dominant you know I keep I keep thinking back every single time I see AJ Terrell I think back to that that national championship game I mean that what Jamar Chase did I mean his physicality is absolutely and he does everything you could possibly want at the wide wide receiver position and then some I love Jalen Waddle I love Devonta Smith but we've seen these two together bring back the dynamic duo, bring in Joe Brady too. Let's have the, the Cincinnati <laughs> Tigers. Let's make it happen. Why not? I, I I would love to see that. Yeah, I think the Jamar Chase evaluation is interesting. I was having this conversation with Seth Galina, who I know is a big LSU guy, and watching a ton of Chase tape this past weekend. And <clears throat> I, I think, and I, I tweeted this, so I'm just kind of repeating the take, but I, th- I do think there are better route runners and there are better athletes at the wide receiver position in this class. But Jamar Chase is an absolute bully at the wide receiver position. Probably will come in at the combine like five, five foot 11 and a half, six foot, but is one of the strongest wide receivers we've really seen in quite some time. Like can absolutely bully kids at the line of scrimmage. And I'm looking for player comparisons for Jamar Chase. And I don't want to put the official stamp on this yet because I'm struggling to find one. But a lot of me wants to potentially say Nuke Hopkins because like he's a shorter receiver that just plays way bigger than he is. But I'm not putting that label on Jamar Chase. I don't think Jamar Chase is Nuke Hopkins level. It's like might as well pair him to, compare him to Jesus Christ. I do think though that some comparisons that do make sense that I did see, like, I, I, here's one. A angrier, stronger Michael Gallup, who's a similar size, plays bigger than he is, good in contested catch situations, not an elite athlete by any means, but can win, in the, win at the catch point consistently. Two, and I kind of like this one more, Pierre Garçon, a little bit stronger Pierre Garçon, who is another bigger-bodied receiver from a weight perspective, but was only five foot 11, six foot coming out. And I think wasn't that elite athlete coming out either. Like, I think Jamar Chase is going to run maybe in the high 4-4s, maybe low 4-5s. That are some of the comps I'm thinking. And for that reason, if you're looking for that type of receiver, which I don't know if the Bengals are or not, I think that's the move to go with. If you're not, if you're looking for an absolute explosive athlete to take the top off like what John Ross was supposed to be, Jalen Waddle is probably the pick here at 5. I think you're being too safe with those comps. Maybe I am being too safe, but I hate being here. I have a, I have a gripe. I hate being stupid with the comps. Like it's yeah. like when people are like, "Oh, he kind of looks like Saquon Barkley with Bernie uh, Barry Sanders's fucking feet and the David Montgomery graphic." Yeah, I, I don't. I hate those comps. Like not every single player is the next like a future Hall of Famer or like an All Pro. You know, like you have to have some modest comps. All right. So I mean, going back to the last few wide receiver class, where would Jamar Chase rank? I I personally think he's probably the best in the last five years best in the last five years yeah so that's missing the mike evans and mark cooper class yeah okay because i forgot that's 2014 now you're right um is that 2014 or is that 2015 it's 2015 yeah uh, i don't know i'd probably put him ahead though of this past year's class all of the receivers in this past year's class and I, am i putting him ahead of aj brown and terry mclaurin after what i know now it's hard to say but i mean coming out you probably were but i mean aj brown and terry mclaurin have been really good same with dk metcalf 
Oh yeah, I mean, like you take AJ Brown if you're offered AJ Brown or Jamar Chase. But I mean, when they're coming out, Mm -hmm. the top three prior to this year would probably be in the PFF college era. So going back to 2014, Amari Cooper, Jerry Judy, Ceedee Lamb. I I think he's probably at that Amari Cooper level. Level might be. Might be. So so, I mean, I think he. I I don't want to. I'm not giving that new Hopkins comp, but I really do think he has a better chance of becoming one of those elite wide receivers than you know. Michael Gallup's good. Pierre Garcon was good for a little bit. Mm -hmm. I I think he has a higher chance of being elite than good. Yeah, which is fair. I think that's good. All right, let's jump to the Philadelphia Eagles now, who are projected pick at six, which obviously could change depending on how Sunday night football goes against the Washington football team. But they're in a very interesting situation as well. Like Jalen Hurts, Carson Wentz, the quarter I, I they can't go quarterback here in my opinion. And they can't trade up for one either. Like they're kind of they're kind of screwed at the quarterback position because that cap hit is absurd. No one is trading for Carson Wentz. I almost think you have to just like Jalen Hurts and Carson Wentz compete all offseason the better quarterback starts, regardless of who's getting paid more. Because whoever gives you the best opportunity to win football games. Because it doesn't matter if Carson Wentz's paycheck is hitting his bank account every two weeks and he's on the bench, or he's hitting his bank account every two weeks and he's starting. You're still paying that money. What matters is the wins. And if Jalen Hurts gives you more opportunity to win football games, then Carson Wentz hits the bench, regardless, again, of that salary cap figure, in my opinion. Moving away from that, Every Eagles fan I know, every time I'm talking about the draft on Twitter and reading other articles, wants a wide receiver. Are they going to go after a Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddell, Devontae Smith, or do they go best defensive player available? Maybe a Micah Parsons, maybe Patrick Sertan of Alabama. That just that secondary is atrocious. Where are you at with the Eagles at six? I think if I mean if Michael Parsons is there when they're picking, they are going to just dial that phone as quickly as possible. You don't like Alex Singleton, Nate Jerry. <laughs> What's you wrong? Know, yeah, I mean, yeah, I know. I, Duke I'm, Riley, you're not have, you're not a fan of those linebackers. I mean, not really, not particularly. Yeah, yeah it could be better, could be worse. Um, <laughs> but no, I I really do think if Michael Parsons there, they are going to absolutely take him 150. percent I'm with you know the Eagles fans, Philly Nation. We've had our moments in the past. We both have, um, you know, your Twitter interactions. But I I agree with them. I would like to see wide receiver, but I think they would go Michael Parsons, and I do think. You know, this is going to be a very interesting situation with Carson Wentz. You know, personally, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised, and I think this would be a situation that I would try to make work out if, you know, Phillip Rivers calls it quits, send Carson Wentz to Indianapolis, reunite with Frank Reich, put Jalen Hurts in there next year. This is his one-year shot. If it works out, it works out. You have your long-term guy. But if it does not work out, then, I mean, you could start to get the ball rolling on, you know, it was kind of the Gardner Minshew situation that we got for a little bit. And we was like, oh, is this guy actually a, you know, a quality starting quarterback? And kind of find out he's, like we said earlier, a good backup. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this case, in this draft, I think they're going to take Micah Parsons. I don't love Micah Parsons at that value. I don't love it at six. I'd rather see them take one of the best receivers here or, or and even though there's not as ranked as highly as Micah Parsons on our board currently, the best cornerback. Pastor Sertan or Caleb Farley, who they think the better cornerback is there. I, I think linebacker at six, and I know I've had this conversation a thousand times, and Micah Parsons, I've said before, is a generational talent. Best linebacker prospect we've seen since Luke Keekley. Where, where would you take Micah Parsons? I feel way more comfortable if there aren't, in this situation, if there aren't really, really good players at other more valuable positions like the wide receiver position in this case and the cornerback position. I think it depends on the class. It always depends on the class. Right. And I think... At six, with how this, how maybe four quarterbacks come off the board, and you have an opportunity to the first or second best receiver in the class, or the best cornerback in this class, with how good Patrick Sertan could be, how how good Caleb Farley could be, I think that's that's where I'm trending in that direction. I don't look at Micah Parsons until I feel like the top one or two wide receivers are off the board, and the top one or two cornerbacks are off the board, depending on where you value those corners. Like, I mean, this cornerback class isn't maybe isn't as good as what Jeffrey Okuda was, what people thought he was coming out, but I still think it's pretty damn good, so much that I think about those positions before I think about Micah Parsons. So I'm probably not looking at him to come off the board until 9 or 10, but he'll probably go ahead of that. I, I, I was I'm kind of surprised. I thought you were going to say back half the first round. Back half the first round would be egregious, because I don't. at that point, I think there will be enough receivers, tackles, and corners off the board to where you could feel more comfortable taking an op ball linebacker at, between that nine and 13 spot, you know, cause that's what, that's what matters. It's not, it's not as simple as like, don't take linebackers in the top 10. It's like, if there are other posi- players available that you have a high, you know, high evaluation on at more valuable positions, that's what you do. I mean, it's as simple as what does a tackle make on his second contract? What does a wide receiver make on his second contract? A corner, all better than linebackers and the linebackers that have been paid fat second contracts, Quan Alexander, CJ Mosley, Schobert, Blake Martinez, 
haven't really panned out, haven't really moved the needle for those defenses. All right, Detroit Lions now picking at seven. That's where they're currently side to pick. They're in a tough spot. They're in like a Matt Ryan Atlanta Falcon spot in terms of ready to move on from the quarterback position, but probably can't do it here at seven. They might be crazy enough to take Micah Parsons here too, despite linebacker being far and away not their worst need or their biggest need, the biggest biggest problem. Where do you see what what situations do you see the Lions going into? Are they a team that maybe takes a corner off the board? You know, it's it's definitely interesting. I could see them if every if Matthew Stafford comes back. You know, that's a given. I think he will. You know, I mean, there is a chance that he doesn't. You know, I think then they would then they would be in a very interesting situation. Um, and I think that uh, Matthew Stafford would garner a lot of interest on the market because he, I, I do think he's a little bit of an underrated quarterback. I agree. You know, and he he has a big you know, abs- you know, it's kind of interesting the on and off splits with Kenny Galladay, um, but I, I still think he's an underrated quarterback. But I do think if everything stays as it is now, I th- I think they do lean cornerback at this at the spot they are at right now. So you're thinking Farley or Patrick Sertan, who they think is better there. Mm-hmm. I also think they could go edge defender, Quiddy Pay, Greg Russo, depending on if they want to attack that position. I mean, they like athletes at that position. It's gonna be a new front office though. Yeah, like, you don't really know what they like. In in, in the past, you'd probably think Quiddy Pay or Gregory Russo would make sense, but if not. Caleb Farley, Patrick Sertan, and then the wide receiver position, if you're big on Jalen Waddle, big on Devontae Smith, I think those are two guys that you could go after there as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, I it's coverage over pass rush. I love Quiddy Pay, but mm-hmm. you know, if they if they take Quiddy Pay and Patrick Sertan or Caleb Farley's still there for him, I think that would be No, I agree. I, yeah, I would agree that, that would definitely be a bad I, one. I think I would target I would target corner over the the edge defender class. Yeah, absolutely. And it definitely it, on the board. It definitely depends on who the the new GM is, you know, where their mind and their thinking is because if you get one of those traditional old football guys in there, they might take a nose tackle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they might they might take a nose tackle. Speaking of which, the New York Giants are slotted to pick at 8 and maybe they do take a nose tackle, grab another one. I think Leonard enough. Leonard will Williams and Dalvin Thompson are both projected to be free agents this offseason. Two of their bigger interior defensive linemen. They obviously have Dexter Lawrence there. I, I think they re-signed one of those guys. I know Dalvin Thompson's a big presence in that locker room, a guy that that team really does build, uh, really does support. I think they could see him resign before um, him get resigned for the New York Giants before he hits free agency. But projected now to pick at eight here, I think they have to go wide receiver. I don't think the three best receivers in this class are all off the board by the time they're picking at eight. And I think they have to go after a wide receiver now, whether it's Jalen Waddle, maybe you don't know in this situation, Jamar Chase, Henry Ruggs. I'm not Henry Ruggs. <laughs> Devontae Smith. I think that's where my mind immediately jumps. Do you have a different opinion? Do they take do they not take best receiver on the board? Um, you know, Dave Gettleman, he's an interesting guy. I, I think I wouldn't be surprised if he goes edge here. He go gets a guy like Quiddy Pay. Um, that would be something. It would be, especially with the, all those wide receivers there. I'm right there with you. They, I feel like they have to go wide receiver. They absolutely have to. I'm Daniel Jones has not been great. Yeah, I think He's we been might better than maybe the box score suggests, but he has not been great. Uh, that's exactly what I was about to say. I think we're hating on Daniel Jones just a little bit too much. I don't think he's Sam Darnold level, Mitchell Trubisky no. level. He's a little bit better than that, but he has been great. You know, I think, but they haven't really done a good job in surrounding him with weapons. I think they have to do that here. But yes. I, you never know with with Dave Gettleman what he's going to do. Dude, if they don't surround him with weapons, they're going to be in the same situation that kind of Sam Darnold is a little bit, and they like don't really know if he's good enough. The offensive line is bad. Shay Lemieux has been the worst pass protecting offensive guard in football this year. They're starting Andrew Thomas, who has the lowest, you know, pressure or highest pressure rate allowed of any first round rookie offensive tackle this year. Like they have not, they've done a ve- not just a bad job, a very bad job of building around Daniel Jones and instead investing in defensive tackles and those things on the on the other side of the ball. They need to try and add some weapons here offensively for Daniel Jones, specifically receivers, tight ends, even though Evan Ingram's a pro bowler, try and get him some pass catchers to move them forward. And Saquon Barkley getting back healthy matters. Also, adding a receiver here, I think, would be big. I, I think that would be the obvious move, in my opinion. But I could also see them going edge defender, Quiddy Pay, Greg Russo. All right, two more picks left here. The Carolina Panthers at 9 and the Denver Broncos at 10. The Carolina Panthers a week ago were projected to pick at 4. Now they're at 9. I was locked in to the new GM coming in to Carolina, Aussie, uh, Huni fired, and going after a quarterback, moving on from Teddy Bridgewater, maybe trading him, whatever. Maybe having him as a backup at $23 million a year. <laughs> now... Again, this purgatory situation, they're probably going to roll into next year with Teddy Bridgewater under center. on that Because, I mean, I don't know which team's trading for him at $23 million cap hit. And probably going to have to try and build around him. But here at nine, do you take the best wide receiver to try and make this monster receiving core? Curtis Samuel probably leaves in free agency. So you have DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson in the pick here at nine. Or 
Do you look at the defensive side of the ball, at a corner, at an edge defender, at the top of the draft? And then there's even tackle to be in the conversation. Rayshon Slater, Sam Cosme, Christian Derisaw, Virginia Tech. They could go a lot of different ways here at nine. I don't know their best option. What would you say their best case scenario is for Carolina? Yeah, I mean, if we ranked all 32 state of the franchises, you know, what, what, who's in the best situation to compete in the next five to 10 years? Mm-hmm. Carolina Panthers may be the bottom three. They're it's not a good situation. They're in a really, really rough spot here. I, I, I did not like the, the signing of Teddy Bridgewater, it has not been going all that well for them. Um, you know, I think best case scenario for them, there's a quarterback there for the taking, but I'm really not sure that's going to be. And the same can be said for the Denver Broncos at 10. They both of them really need a quarterback here to take. Mm-hmm. You know that that's where they need help at. Denver more so than Carolina. Yeah, I mean D- Denver's already settled that wide receiver. I mean they have an incredible wide receiver in core. Um, Drew Locke's not the guy. I know. I I don't I don't know this for sure, but I have to, I have a feeling that John El- Elway of all people, you know Brock Brock Osweiler, big fan back a few years ago, is just going to be salivating if Trey Lance is there. He's going to be super yeah. excited, throw a party, get blacked out. I think that's <laughs> his dream scenario. And, but I'm, I'm not sure that's going to happen because I think if Trey Lance is there at number nine, the Carolina Panthers are going to take him because I know, you know, this front office wants to get analytical. They want to get deep into the data. We're getting deep in the data. We want quarterback. I have a feeling that they're going to be on the same page. But yeah, I, I think it's going to take a lot for them to be in a position. Otherwise, would I be would I be crazy to say they should just trade back and get a guy like Mac Jones? No, I don't think you're crazy at all. Like I, I think tra- trading back and still landing a quarterback in the first round feels like an insane concept to me. I think those are guys that, regardless of where you value them, it's very difficult to get a quarterback after trading back. You know, the, you know they had to. You know, Teddy Bridgewater was traded up for in the past. I mean, Patrick Mahomes, a, a, a quarterbacks are oftentimes traded up for, and I think I don't think it, Jordan Love at the back end of the first round this past year traded up for at the back end of the first round. I think it's gonna be very difficult to trade back and then still land despite maybe having a lower valuation on him, a quarterback because of the positional value. I, I think they're in an interesting spot where like you kind of have to stay put. Like, and, and if you want a quarterback and you believe he's the guy, you take him. I, I, I'm, so I'm looking at the, the order right now. I feel like a team that might be interested in trading up into the top 10 is your Las Vegas Raiders to get a cornerback. Because a they're, corner? A corner. Because their corners are awful. Damon Arnett. They've invested been, so much at the position, though. But they're so bad. I still, I don't, still, I don't think so Mike, Mike Mayock's going to be against that. I think, I don't think he'll want to do that. Damon Arnett, Trayvon surprised. Mullen, Jonathan Abram. I don't, I think they're going to be like, no, we've invested way too much in the secondary. We need to pivot. It's like, I don't know. Like, I, I, I could see them overthinking that. <sighs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Right. You I mean, right. all three of those guys have not been good this year, though. Yeah. All right. So Teddy Bridgewater this year, though, ranks among quarterbacks with at least 300 dropbacks this year, ranks 23rd in PFF passing grade so far this year. Has not been good. And I didn't like the signing originally because I didn't think he was going to be awful. I thought he was going to be just a little bit less than good. And that's the worst situation you could be in at the quarterback position, especially having one on a three-year deal with a $23 million cap hit in 2021. Drew Locke has ranked 28th in PFF passing rate at 60.8. An obvious upgrade is needed there. And we said before the season, when they threw the kitchen sink at adding skill players in Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler, and Albert Okui Bunam out of Missouri, that, that uh, Garrett Bowles has played well. Like, the offensive line has not been bad. Dalton Reisner has played well. If he doesn't do it this year, you have to move on. And he hasn't. It's time to move on from Drew Locke. If they're in a position to grab Trey Lance there at 10, or if they can trade up and grab Trey Lance if they feel like the value is that good, that I think is the situation for Teddy and the Carolina Panthers. I honestly feel like they're kind of screwed now. I don't think it makes sense to like mortgage the future, trade up, and then have a $23 million cap hit with Teddy next year and try and groom a rookie quarterback. I think you're better off trying to build around Teddy, add some more pieces, add some more young talent, go develop the culture with Matt Rule, and add the best non-quarterback available at a high positional value, whether that's offensive tackle, corner, could make sense. If Taylor Moton leaves in free agency, offensive tackle is going to be clear cleared for them. They still need help at corner. Pass rush hasn't been that good outside of Brian Burns. I think they're going to be in a spot where they pick the best non-quarterback available. Maybe Michael Parsons here. Try and get Luke Heekloo's replacement here at nine. Who knows? Um, I, so... You know, I'm I'm not a huge guy, huge fan of trading up. Um, but if I'm the Denver Broncos and I'm picking tenth overall, I I might just you know give a call to Miami at three, absolutely, and say I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the farm. I'm giving you everything to get that third overall pick because I feel like if and I don't think they're complete, just one quarterback away from being good. But if they actually want to be you know semi decent within mm-hmm. the next few years, they have to do that. I mean, it all comes down to your evaluation. Yeah. If John Elway feels really confident that X quarterback is the best quarterback he's ever seen, 
and he's there at three, he's going to trade up for him. And I think you should. And I think if, but if you were like, I don't know, I don't really like any of the quarterbacks after Lawrence, then you stay put and try and find other ways to get this thing done. But I do think they need to actively pursue an upgrade at the quarterback position. Field offers, you know, look at Matt Ryan, look at Matt Stafford, Jimmy G, Carson Wentz. Like you, you got to explore all these options. If you think there's an upgrade out there in free agency via trade, do that before the draft. And then in the draft, if you feel really confident in the valuation of one of these young quarterbacks, go get your guy. Because we've seen time and time again, people, this is another conversation we'll have, and we'll finish the podcast with this. People say with the Jets, they have way too many needs. They're not a quarterback away. Why would they take a quarterback? Trade down or draft Pedesa or whatever it may be. That, that's not the issue. Any team drafting that highly is not a quarterback away. The Cincinnati Bengals weren't a quarterback away. The Arizona Cardinals weren't a quarterback away. Baker Mayfield, when he was drafted for the Browns, were not a quarterback away. You draft a quarterback in the top three or number one overall because you need the quarterback before you can start to build around him, before you can start to evaluate the rest of this roster. You need a quarterback to really get an understanding of what's good and what's bad. I mean, it's a big reason why Jalen Hurts was inserted as a starter. They, didn't even, they couldn't even evaluate this team, how badly Carson Wentz was playing. You grab a quarterback because you need the quarterback before you can even be competent in this league. Waiting until you have all the pieces before you draft one is when you're going to be drafting like the Broncos are or the Panthers are outside the top seven, top eight, and having to force your way to find a quarterback rather than being in this position that you rarely are in, hopefully, drafting inside the top three, top five, and able to get after a quarterback. Tresh, fantastic podcast. The offseason upon us. Next week, you won't be with us, unfortunately, but we'll have to bring you on with Mike. Us three in the studio will be pretty fun. We're going to three podcasts a week, three episodes a week on two-for-one drafts, previewing the Senior Bowl, free agency, the draft. We're going to have a ton of prospect interviews. should be a ton of fun this offseason in the draft, but... um. A ton of fun, man. I'm really looking forward to it. Next episode will be the Wednesday, or no, we're recording Thursday. We'll come out Thursday. We're going to look at ahead of the week, look at the college football playoff, more draft prospect conversation. Maybe we'll look at more, more mock scenarios, depending on how the week pans out. Should be a lot of fun stuff. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the PFF 2 for 1 Drafts podcast. Until next time, Austin Gale and Anthony Trash, 2 for 1 Drafts. You want to get rid of me and get back to more great PFF YouTube content? All you have to do is push that button right there and subscribe. Thanks for watching.